We are drawn to stories. There's something about the human condition that when we get together, we tend to tell stories. Here uh, this month, coming up soon, we have Thanksgiving. And for most of us, there'll be some kind of gathering of friends or family where we tell stories. And, and often they'll be the same stories you've heard before, but there's something about when we get together, we like to tell those stories as we gather. You know, you think about perhaps you grew up and you went to camp, and around the campfire, you tell scary stories, you know? You... Uh, you enjoy that thrill of a good, scary story. Perhaps you think about the last book you've read and that story that kept drawing you back to it to, to read and to hear it all the way to the end. We are a people that are drawn to stories. And there's some aspect of, of story that entertains us. I think that's how we often think about story today. We're just like, entertain me. But there's also this aspect of story that stories inform us. Stories teach us. There's a both and to kind of the entertainment factor and the information factor of stories. You think about humanity from day one of humanity. There was something about the fact that humans told stories to teach the next generation. That's how we instruct. Many times we, we tell a story to pass along information to the next generation. I invite you to turn with me to the biblical book of Ruth. We're going Old Testament for a mini-series on Ruth here. In the book of Ruth, it's a compelling story. It's a narrative. One element of Ruth is that it takes us from the time of the judges we see in chapter 1, verse 1, to the final uh, verses of Ruth chapter 4, where it takes us from the time of the judges to the time of the kings. So we've moved from this man, Elimelech, here, we move all the way to King David in the, the kind of the, in some ways, the, the, the storyline here of Ruth. But it does more than that. It teaches us about relationships. It teaches about what redemption means as it points forward to Jesus Christ. And so I hope we'll, we'll grow in relationship, we'll grow in understanding of redemption as we walk into the book of Ruth together. As I mentioned, we'll be in a little mini-series here. There's four chapters. Our plan right now is to take one chapter a week as we move through the book. This opening chapter, which we'll read in just a moment, is full of tragedy. We meet the characters in the first uh, few verses of chapter 1, and, and we hear about their hardships and the, the weight of difficult decisions that they go through in the opening chapter of this book. But there's also, in the midst of this deep tragedy here, there are these glimmers of hope that we cling to, and we, we, we uh, see the characters grow and develop in throughout the book. So let's read this story together. As we move into it, join me here in chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Machlan and Chilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives, and the women of, of the women of Moab, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Mahlon and Chilion also died. And so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose and her daughters-in-law that she might return to the country of Moab, for she had, from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had delivered his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. 
And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we'll return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they, they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourself from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And all the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me? The Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the time of barley harvest. Now as we move into this narrative, it's always a little bit challenging to kind of outline a story, a, a narrative especially in the scriptures. I want to do this with you today. I'd like to take a moment and really try to hear the story, to, to move into and hear this text. And then secondly, I want to see God in the text because God's the main character. And then thirdly, we want to understand ourselves as we, we move uh, from the story to seeing God and we want to move to where, hey, we want to understand ourselves more uh, clearly and apply this. Let's start with hearing the story, hearing the story. Let me two, say two comments as we start into the story of Judges, and they come right away in verse 1 of chapter 1 to give us some context to this story. The first is that this is the time of the Judges. The book right before Ruth is called Judges. It's referring to this time period of Israel. And if you read about this part of Israel's history, it's a long time chapter. It's hundreds of years of Israel's history in the book of Judges. And if you read that story of the family history of Israel, it's one of those things you kind of want to skip over. It's kind of like that. You don't want to mention that kind of dark years, if you will, of Israel's history. It's ugly, okay? When you look at the time of the Judges, it's like that yearbook. That you're like, burn the yearbook, you know? Make fun of my dad. Looking back at my dad's marriage photos, he's got the Bell bottoms and the chops, you know, and you're like, ugh, you know, burn some of those pictures. You're like, ooh, you know. When you, that old yearbook, that old picture, you're like, yeah, it's kind of that, that mentality here. The book of Judges is like, ugh, you don't want to go back to those years. It was bad. There was captivity, there was violence, there was massive moral failure. It, it was a, a dark time of Israel's history. And it was captivated in this statement that's throughout the book of Judges that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Okay? That, that's, that summarizes the book. And it helps us understand why things fell apart. If everyone does what's right in their own eyes, if man is not inherently good, if he's actually sinful from the heart, then man just following his heart 
is, is not a good thing. And when all of us do this, there's inevitable conflict and, and inevitable tearing down of society. There was social anarchy, political unrest, spiritual chaos that describes the time of the judges and scarily beginning more and more to describe our day, right? This was the context of this story of Ruth. It took place, verse 1, in the time of the judges when this was going on in Israel's history. And it's kind of ironic because as we move into this text, we see that, that in the midst of all that chaos and that mess, that God's doing some incredible things. God's preserving his name and his remnant through, as we see in this story. So that's kind of a context. In the midst of ruin, God is working. The second, the second thing I want to say as we kind of get into this storyline, kind of backdrop is this idea of a Moabite. Again, verse 1, the, the, there's this aspect of famine in the land and get hardships. They move to the country of Moab. Now, now we might just be tempted to gloss over that. That's why I stop and make a couple of comments here that as they go down to the land of Moab in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 here, it's, it's something that, that an Israelite back in the day would have just cued in on because the Moabites were, were deep-seated enemies of Israel. Okay? The, the Moabites come from back in Genesis, uh, the time of Genesis 19, when Lot has incest with his daughters, and, 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 um, and, and Lot's, Lot's daughters, from, from that incest comes the people of Moab. And then later in the book of Numbers, uh, verses chapter 21 to 25, you remember the Balak, Balaam uh, thing going on? Balak the king hires Balaam, the false prophet, to curse Israel. They don't want Israel passing through their land and, their, their, uh, and the wilderness wanderings. And, and the, the Balak is the king of Moab. Okay? So Moab, the Moabites, were, were an, they had animosity to Israel. They didn't let them pass their land. They're trying to get spiritual cursing on the people of Israel. It's a mess. They become one of the distinct enemies of Israel. Deuteronomy 23, 20, 23 verse 3 in Deuteronomy, they were the sworn enemies now of, of Israel. So in the cultural context here, Ruth and Orpah are... Are, are, are now married into Israel and this family here, and they are, are, are just enemies culturally in a massive way to Israel. So, and you see throughout the book, you hear Ruth the Moabitess, Ruth the Moabitess. It emphasizes it, that, that stark contrast. So, so cued into that, let's move into the story. The story here in chapter 1 tells about two main things, one of loss and one of loyalty. Loss and loyalty in chapter 1 as we kind of summarize and we hear this story. The loss is emphasized really in verse 1 down to verse 5, and then we see the remnants of it continue in, into the next section here. But that opening paragraph, as we meet the characters, look at verse 1. Verse 1 makes this phrase, it says, a man, and it skips down a little bit, a man, he and his wife and his two sons. And it begins to tell the story. And by verse 5, there's almost a parallel phrase. Verse 5 uh, says, The woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So verse 1, the man and his wife and his two sons. And at the end, verse 5, the woman is now without her husband and her two sons. It's a summary of great loss that's happening here in this passage. And it's one of the things where it's kind of, I was struggling this week of how do I communicate the aspect of loss? I mean, we understand it, some aspect of, of being a, a parent and, and losing your kids or losing your husband. We understand aspects of that, but I want to draw into the significance of that in, in Israel's time period here. You see, today, we're like, you know, 18, maybe if I'm feeling generous, 21 as a parent, you can live in my home, but after that, you're out, buddy right? We're like, get out and stay out. I love you, you know? But, but we're like, that's our mentality as parents today. We're like, and go, you know? Back in this time period, it, it was significant to have children and significant primarily to have a son because there were two things. One, it was the family name. 
the son would keep the family name, and that was, that was very significant in its day. And the other thing is, is that back in this day, you would add an addition to your home for your teenage son to get married, have a wife, and help run the family farm, keep the family business going, take care of the family herds. Like, that's what would happen back in this day. So, so it wasn't just about family name. It was about, you know, provision. It was about the son helping to run the family farm and keeping things going and providing for the family. It was, it was hugely significant. So, so this loss in the opening here is a massive loss. Naomi would be a widow without husband, without sons, She'd be in abject poverty. She would be at the complete mercy of others, showing some kind of generosity to her to scrap by in life. That's going to be her story, apart from something massive happening. So it's, it's huge loss back here in biblical day. It's heart-wrenching. Just, that's just kind of the aspect of like, she is done Obviously, there's the aspect of the heart-wrenching loss. I pray that this would never happen to you or to me, a parent burying her child, burying husband or wife, burying your your life partner. Just this week, I I came across uh, a a, a blog, uh, author and blogger Tim Challies wrote this on Wednesday, November 4th. He wrote this and said, In all the years I've been writing, I've never had to type words more difficult, more devastating than these. Yesterday, the Lord called my son to himself. My dear son, my sweet son, my kind son, my godly son, my only son. Nick was playing a game with his sister and fiancé and many other students when he suddenly collapsed, never regaining consciousness. Students, paramedics, and doctors battled valiantly but could not save him. He's with the Lord he loved, the Lord he longed to serve. We have no answers to what, the what or why questions. Yesterday, yesterday, I leaned and I cried and cried until we could cry no more, until there were no tears left to cry. Then later in the evening, we looked each other in the eye and said, we can do this. We don't want to do this. But we can do this, this sorrow, this grief, this devastation, because we know we don't have to do it in our own strength. We can do it like Christians, like a son and daughter of the father who knows what it is to lose a son. We traveled through the night to get to Louisville so we could be together as family, and we ask that you remember us in your prayers as we mourn our loss together. We know there will be grueling days and sleepless nights ahead, but for now, even though our minds are bewildered and our hearts are broken, our hope is fixed and our faith is holding our son as home. Now, this is something that I like, like, man, the, the grace to write that, right? I would pray that this never happens to you or me, but, but this is the reality of life is we live, and because we live in a sin-cursed world, we die. And sometimes the parent buries the child or the husband, the wife, or the wife, the husband. This is the reality of great loss. And it's part of the reason why, as we look down at verse 13, there's the biblical word bitterness that comes into play here. Because on the back door of loss, often bitterness likes to creep in. And that's the reality. Bitterness is the back door companion to loss. It loves to creep in. And you notice what Naomi says down in verse 20 as well. When she's back in Bethlehem and she's welcomed home, what does she say? She says, call me Mara. It's the biblical word. It means bitterness. So so not only has she lost her family name with her son's dying, but now she renames herself and says, call me Mara. Bitter. She summarizes her life this way in verse 21. I went out full, and what? I return empty. Full to empty. This is the amazing loss that she feels, and that this, this passage really puts on display. Amazing loss. 
It's also a story about loyalty. Let's look at that for a moment. You see, there's this, there's a surprising source of, of loyalty and help in this passage. It comes from a foreigner. And beyond that, like we emphasized earlier, beyond is a foreigner, a Moabite. That's where this loyalty is shown. You've, you've heard the story, right? There, there's two daughters-in-law, and, and one kind of is, is pushed away and goes, and Ruth clings, the text tells us. Ruth clings to her. And she makes this amazing statement in verses 16 and 17 here in this passage. She says, I will not leave you. Your home will be my home. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She, she is extremely loyal. In the book of Ruth, there's this term hesed, that, that, uh, the Hebrew term that comes out throughout the book. And I believe that, that we see and de- it develops in the book of Ruth. You notice right here in the, in the scriptures, uh, we see it with Naomi's statement. We'll look at it in just a moment. But in the Hebrew scriptures, it's a term that predominantly is applied to God. There are two key terms for God emphasized in the Old Testament scriptures. One is the holiness of God. The other is his has said. It's a, it's a difficult term to translate it kind of based on the ways, all the ways it's translated. It comes out love. It comes out kindness. It comes out loving kindness. It's translated grace or mercy. It's, it's, it's this idea of covenant loyal love. And, and what you see right here in verse 8 is Naomi wishes it upon her daughters-in-law. She says, may the Lord, may Yahweh, grant to you kindness. May Yahweh show you kindness. That's what uh, she says here in this passage. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Hesed is a term that is used, as I mentioned, about the very character of God, and yet we see it developed in this story through biblical characters, through these people involved in the story. And right here, we see it in displayed in Ruth, the Moabite. She is extremely loyal. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will embrace your people. I will embrace your God. She stays with, she puts on display this covenant loyalty like God does. It doesn't say as soon as you're angry or bitter about life, I'm not just ditching you. When you sin, I'm not running away. I'm here to stay. I'm loyal. That's what Ruth puts on display here. And that's what the story of chapter 1 tells us, loss and loyalty. Now let's look at God in this story. I just kind of obviously gave us an avenue into that with the word has said here in this passage. But let's look at seeing God in this text of chapter 1 in the book of Ruth. There's kind of two things I want to talk about. One is the big picture, and the other is the details, okay, when we think about God. In the story of Ruth, part of the, the kind of the human story is Elimelech, is his family line is going to die out. It's a major problem from, from the beginning of the book to the end. Is Elimelech's name going to be erased, his family name from the earth? It's, it's a big deal in the sense of it's your family name. It's a big deal. But the main character of Scripture is who? It's God. The main character of Scripture is God. So in the, the big picture, it's not so much about just a family name here, but it's God and his name and his will being worked out in the canvas of history. And, and what you see about God here is it's not that he's not concerned about Elimelech, but you see there's a bigger picture. Because if you go through the book, it's not just about Elimelech and his family name go to the end of the, the book, chapter 4, and if you skip down to the end of the book, you see here that, I hate ruining the story if you don't know the story, but let me just kind of highlight this big picture that God's about. You see in verse 17, they call this son's name Obed, and Obed is the father of Jesse, the father of David, okay? So, so here's this God's about a bigger picture than you and I. We get like, oh, my name, my family, all these problems, and God's just operating on a bigger picture scale. God's bringing about 
his king for his nation in David through this story, not just preserving Elimelech's family name. Okay? So in the big picture here, God is working on a vastly larger scale, if you will. He's orchestrating national stuff, world stuff, because through David and his family line come who? Comes the Messiah, comes Jesus. And so we're, we're like pointing all the way forward to a way bigger problem than your name being in some, some uh, continuing on for generations to come. It's, it's your, your problem of sin and the, and the redemption that's in Jesus that, that God's dealing with on the grand scale all the way to Mary and Joseph, descendants of David and Jesus Christ. So this powerful story of the gospel that's taking place in the book of Ruth. That's the scale that God is working on in the big picture. But let's walk into the details as well, because I think this, this book of Ruth helps us to kind of start looking into the details of life that this God who's on the big picture doesn't just kind of throw away. So, so let's look at it here. Through, we have already mentioned this aspect of Hesed, through all the difficulties, through the dark valley that Naomi is going through, who does God bring into her life? God brings in this surprising source of loyalty in Ruth, right? The details of God, this great companion for the dark valley that she's walking into with death and hopelessness, God's provided Ruth for such a time as this in this book. And what's interesting in the book of Ruth is the narrator doesn't directly reveal God in like, hey, God gave Ruth for such a time as this. The, the, the narrator of, of Ruth doesn't do this. The narrator of Ruth, we only hear about God really through the dialogue, through the conversations that are going on between the characters. The narrator doesn't say, hey, let me cue you into what God's doing. That's not what the narrator in the book of Ruth does. It, what, what the narrator does is helps to cue us into the, the, the biblical teaching on the providence of God. The providence of God is God really working behind the scenes kind of indirectly. You don't see him, but God is working out the details of life in, in times like these, in times like the judges, God is preserving a remnant. And he's doing so all the way to David, all the way to the Messiah. The details that God is in. I like to describe the providence of God as the invisible hand of God. God is working. We don't see his direct contact of what he's doing. But you find God in the details. The challenge with that is it can be hard to interpret the circumstances, can it? It can be hard to see God and what he's really doing. And when you think about the providence of God, I don't want to stand up here and pretend to you like I have it all figured out. Because there are times where the providence of God feels awfully sweet. And you're like, man, God is so good. And there's other times where the providence of God tastes extremely bitter and lays you low. And, and I just want to say, I don't have this all figured out. I, I don't have this like, I, I, can, I can, you know, I got God figured out. Let me just tell you about him. You know, but I can say this, God is God. What we cannot do, you and I cannot put God in a box and seek to control him. God is God. And he is king over all the circumstances. He is king and sovereign over everything. And God is God. But he's at work in the details. And so we want to look for him in the details. Can I, can I show you this? And you see it through the story of Ruth where we say, you want to trust that God really is known by his hesed. Because what does, what does Naomi do? She begins to say, God's not a God of hesed, his loyal covenant love. God's a God who's mean and he's, he's, he's nasty in his orchestrating of life. So the circumstances can be interpreted either way. It's challenging. It calls for us to trust that God is who he says he is and trust him with his loyal love. Let me look at the, one more detail with you in this passage. Look down at verse 22 of chapter 1. The final verse here. The author kind of seemingly throws 
this little random detail in the close of chapter 1. He says, they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. It's, it's just a cool little detail, right? And um, let me just highlight this for just a moment because it helps us again cue into how the narrative works, how the narrator is telling us these little details to help us along. You know, God knows what we have need of before we even ask it. What are two widows going back and traveling far to another land here, what are they going to need? They're going to need some food, right? And God just just doesn't go, oh, let's just, I forgot about that. Let me just change the season. No, but, but barley's planted in autumn kind of time frame. It's harvested in the spring, April, May. When do these guys arrive back in Jerusalem? It just so happens they arrive at barley harvest. Do you see some of the loving kindness of God? Right here in the little details of the text, God is kind. He knows what we have need of, and and we're cued into this even by the term Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? Bethlehem literally means house of bread. And they come back to Bethlehem, her hometown, and what's available is food for two widows, is God provides, God is good and he's full of loving kindness and God is in the details so yes God's the God of the big picture but God is a God of the details and we see it here in this text so we want to hear the story we want to go into the details of the narrative we want to see God in the story of Ruth and in the story of scripture but we also want to understand ourselves better so let's look at understanding ourselves well through this text this story of loss and loyalty. So let's, let's, and let me comment here as we move into this. Sometimes it's challenging for us to apply Scripture. Can I encourage you guys to dig into the details of the Scripture? I know for some reason we're like, sometimes we read text and we're like, eh, I don't know what this is all about. I don't know how I would apply this if I read chapter 1 of Ruth. Let me encourage you to, as you read Move into the details of the text because in those details, it'll help you to apply the scriptures. Okay, You and I don't change in the fog like, ah, oh, Ruth was a nice lady and uh, they moved back at barley time. You know, it, but as you move into the details of the text, it helps you to learn better and better to apply the text. Let's, let's walk into that together, okay? Because we don't change in the fog, we change in the details. So in the aspect of loss which we talked about earlier. The aspect of of loss, that that when there's loss, the the backdoor companion of loss is often bitterness. As we think about ourselves and and learning and growing from this text, you know, anger is a, bitterness is a form of anger. Anger is an emotion that says, that's wrong, I'm against it. And anger can go in different directions, right? (laughs) One of the two common ones that, that people talk about is anger... Folks, either they blow up or they clam up. You know, like you have that raging hot anger, this volcanic roar. And then you have this like icy cold, I'm not talking to you people, you know. Like, I'm done with you. You know, that, 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 that aspects of anger and how we respond to it. Bitterness is a form of anger. It's, it's anger that takes a seat down deep in the soul. That's what bitterness is. It just takes a seat down deep in the soul. But, but I want to tell you this. It, it doesn't just stay there. Okay? It doesn't just stay on its seat down deep in your soul. It, it spreads like gossip. It, it just it, it infiltrates and grows where you gave it a seat down deep in your soul. That's what bitterness does. It's that form of anger that, that uh, bitterness it, it grows roots and it takes up residence in our soul, deep down in us. So that, you see here, there's, there's this aspect of, one aspect of bitterness can be, there's just this cloud of, I'm upset, I'm angry, and this cloud of bitterness that just follows you around where you're like, I just constantly am ready to go, right? And then there's the other side, where you kind of see more of, Ru- of Naomi here, of this like, I'm just so beat down that God's against me. I have this settled conviction that God's against me. And life has just grown cold. God's against me. You guys just go home. I'm done. It's over for me. 
Okay? There, there's that, that aspect of anger here, this settled cold fact that, that Naomi puts on display. We, we might kind of be tempted to call it depression in our, our, our current day, but it's this, I'm just weighed down by life and, and it's, a, it's, it's settled against me, life is. So why try that Naomi seems to put on display in this text? As we think about the providence of God, it can be difficult to interpret. But let me ask you this morning, when you think about your life, you think about this aspect of bitterness, how are you responding to life? As you track down your responses, what are you seeing? Are you seeing a root of bitterness that's deep down in your soul that you thought you gave it a seat and it was going to behave itself in that little corner? Bitterness doesn't stay there, okay? It spreads. And so be aware. Take a fresh look into your life and your responses to see if there's any bitterness in your heart. The other aspect we talk about through the narrative, we want to see ourselves, is the aspect of loyalty. As followers of Jesus, we're called to put on display the character of God. We want to put on display Jesus who, who made God visible. He made him known to us. And we are called to make the, the character of God known, to put it on display. Ruth does that in this passage primarily in the aspect of loyalty. Can I ask you right now, is there anybody in your life who's trying to push you away? What does Naomi do here? Naomi is saying, go away, there's, there's no hope. Logic would tell you there's no future with me. So, so just go away. Get out. And Ruth says, no way. I'm going to be loyal. You know, people can push you away, and, and here's the reality. Sometimes we're all too obliged to, to give them that, like, you're pushing me away. I've been waiting for this moment now. Bye-bye. You know, go, go, go. Leave me. You know, we're, we're all too obliged sometimes to go, sure, I didn't want that anyway, you know? And, and, and so loyalty, what does loyalty look like? This key picture of God here that we're called to put on display, the characters put on display the very character of God. Here's the reality, folks. Some of the people pushing you away or the people that you're like, sure, go ahead. Those people are often the ones most in need of seeing the character of God put on display. Can I say that again? Some of the people, many of the people pushing you away are the very ones that need to see the character of God on display. So when you think about you in this text and you think about life, who is trying to push you back? Who's trying to push you away? We will miss huge opportunities with people if we just, as soon as somebody pushes us away, we're like, ah, I didn't want that anyway. Or I'm not even going to try. Or God calls for hesed, and that looks like chapter 1. It looks like loyalty. And so it, it says, I'm not going to just let you push me away. I'm going to be loyal and I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to move towards you. And that's what Ruth does displaying the character of God in this passage. God is a God who we've given him every excuse to leave. Your sin and my sin has said, God, you don't want this. And what has God done? God has continued to pursue. And what we learn from Ruth chapter 1 is God calls us to this kind of loyal love put on display in relationships. That's what's on display here and what we're meant to learn from passages like this. Will you move towards people or just be pushed away? You know, this story is a, is a compelling story. It's a powerful story. Each of us are drawn to story. And so I want to pray as we move into this, we're going to try to tackle chapter 2 next Sunday, I, I want to encourage you to, to hear the story. Move into the story. Hear it well. See God in the story, and then don't miss understanding ourselves deeper and better through it. So let me pray as we ask God's Word to continue molding and shaping our character to look like God's character. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your amazing mercy, your loving kindness 
is better than life. And Lord, as we think about texts like this, as we've had a chance to just chew on this brief chapter of Scripture in story format, I pray you take this campfire experience, if you will, Lord, to teach us and grow us. Not just to be entertained by the story, but that you might help us to, to receive it and to hear your truth in it. And so, God, we pray that you would, would grow us. We pray, and, and we, Lord, desperately need your Spirit. Lord, there's, there's no, nothing natural in us that says, I'm going to move towards those who are pushing me away. There's nothing natural in us that says, I don't need this bitterness. I, I will not go down the dead-end road of bitterness. We sometimes revel in it. And so, God, would you, by the power of your Spirit, help us? Would you use relationships like you used Ruth with Naomi to help her as she started to go down the road of bitterness? Would you use relationships in our families, in, in our church family? God, we need your grace to see you put on display to a world who do, so desperately needs to see you. God, we live in an age where people don't see you. You are your invisible hand, and, and they're not going to your revelation of Scripture, and they can't see your invisible hand orchestrating life and God, would you help us to be your hands and feet, to put you on display, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Keith, you come. All right, several announcements as we prepare for our baptism uh, coming up here in just a moment. I do want to remind you that we're in the middle of Operation Christmas Child. If you are interested, we've got boxes out in the lobby that you can pick up and share that um, we, they need to be back next week so that we can get them taken care of. So you basically have a week. You can pick them up today or sometime this week. Uh, but we ask you to fill that up and bring it back, and we'll take care of that uh, in due time. We've got a Prime Timers event that's coming up not this Wednesday, but another week out from now, I believe. And I uh, want to invite the Prime Timers to take note of that in the bulletin. I want to spend just a moment to highlight the um, praise service that we're looking at. Next week is a regular service. We've got Sunday school and a regular church. The following week, the, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we're going to take a, a very fascinating approach. I'm looking forward to this. Pastor Ben says he's actually going to shorten this service a little bit. That in and of itself will be interesting to observe. All right? So we'll look forward to that part. But the reason we're doing it is because we want to involve our entire church family in a time of praise and testimony to God. So you can see the schedule that we have put together in the bulletin. We're going to meet together at our regular 1030, no Sunday school service, but we'll meet at 1030. Uh, we'll have our regular service shortened, and then we'll take a brief break so that our children's church can come join us, uh, sitting back with families. Then we'll take a time of singing together, um, praising God for testimony. Um, one of the things we want to highlight is in the back, uh, there are two boxes that are identified for giving song requests all right that's not offerings there's a song request we got other boxes for offerings we'll talk about that in a minute but you've got the opportunity to to mention your song that you'd like for us to sing during that service and we'll work that out as much as possible and we want a time of testimonies when that's over we're going to take another break so you actually have two breaks during the course of the day we'll take another break and follow that up with a potluck that's the plan now we understand that plans can change but the plan is if you feel comfortable coming down, sharing a meal with us, um, we'll be doing that downstairs in the fellowship hall. If you don't feel uh, comfortable with that, uh, we're trying not to, to let you starve. So we're going to let you out in time to be able to do that. Um, we're not going to look down on anybody who stays. We're not going to look down on anybody who leaves. But we want you to note that. We'll spend uh, more details uh, coming out in the, in the next week. So we want you to understand what's happening with this praise service. This is not something we're trying to, to put anybody into jeopardy with. But we want to give you the opportunity as a church family to revel in what God is doing, even in the midst of our COVID crisis. So that's an important one. That's in the bulletin. There's one other one I want to highlight very quickly, and that's a leaf raking event for our youth group. That's this Saturday. We're going to invite our youth to meet at 9 o'clock here at church, and then they're going to go find leaves to rake. If you look around, um, you probably see a few. And so we want to give you guys the opportunity to help out with that. And uh, you can learn more about that by talking with uh, Al Katzberg or, or um, Pastor.
Pastor Ben. So I'm hoping that Pastor Ben is ready to go behind me here for baptism. If not, we'll just sit and stare at each other. All right. Welcome. Uh, glad you're with us today. Uh, glad the kids are in the back to witness this step of obedience in our life of faith. You know, there's something sweet about each one of us when we come to the knowledge of the truth. When we realize who God is, that, that this isn't just some random thing that happened in life and we're just here for no apparent reason, but that there is a creator God, that he has loved me so much that despite my sin, he died on the cross and rose again and, and, and pursued me this amazing grace. And I've come to the knowledge of the truth. There's something sweet about that. And then, you know, you, you step into fatherhood or for some of you, you step into motherhood and there's something in you that just longs for your son or daughter to come to the knowledge of the truth. You're like, I just want them to, to, to believe and to know Jesus Christ. And, and you know, God is kind to give parents influence with their children. But the reality is there's also that challenge, that danger that we can't guarantee it. We can't make them believe they must believe for themselves. They must accept Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior for their sins and trust in him for their life. Uh, and so I'm super excited today to be able to baptize my daughter Kate. And so I'm going to ask Kate to come down and uh, she's going to bear testimony. So Kate, tell us about your, uh, uh, your salvation, your, what, why you would be baptized um, in front of your church family. I'm happy this morning to share with you the next step in my faith through baptism. I grew up hearing about how sin and corruption entered the world through man and how God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. But as I grew in my faith, I started to understand what everything meant and how much he loves and cares for us. I was saved around the age of nine, and ever since that night, I saw God change my life in his wonderful ways. God loves and cares for us even when we don't deserve it. He is my light and my friend. He lifts me up when I fall down. He is a compassionate and loving God. His word is very uplifting. This is a verse that I've been memorizing for school and has helped me most recently. Psalms 91, 1 through 6. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the air that flies by noonday, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste said day. All right. Okay, I'm super happy to be able to baptize you. Step right over here. All right. I now baptize you in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. I'm going to pray, and then we'll close our time uh, with a song together. Let's, uh, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for this sweet joy in my life that is of no guarantee, but it's purely of your mercy and your grace that you would uh, help my daughter to come to faith in Jesus and, and seek to live a life that's pleasing for you. Bless our church family. Help our church family to encourage her and grow her in the faith. Be part of that discipleship process that you have each one of us on. Would you continue your work, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.